ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this lecture on the era of good feelings. On this day, 10 plus 10 equals 20. I hope you're having a wonderful weekend. Now, I want to talk about uh, this era, uh, although very promising, uh, can be seen as uh, there being some overlaying problems. Uh, if we look, it, it will start with uh, Monroe. Uh, James Monroe will be the president after uh, Madison, uh, who will be the president after uh, Jefferson. This is called the Virginia, and this is kind of a timeline for you, the Virginia dynasty and, and what we've talked about thus far. Uh, and so you have these three men. Obviously, this unit started with Jefferson with the Revolution of 1800. We talked in the last lecture about the uh, War of 1812. Treaty of Ghent ended it, didn't really effectively do anything, although we did beat the British twice, which is saying something. Uh, and the Hartford Convention, biggest thing you need to know about that is it really ended the Federalist Party. And so we get the era of good feelings starting with James Monroe when he became uh, president in 1816. He'll do this uh, traveling, he'll actually visit every state, first president to do so, and he really wanted to unite the people behind one party. As the Federalist Party went away, you really only have the Republican Party left. Um, again, all three of these men from Virginia, all of them had been Secretary of State beforehand. So there's this theory uh, with these three that you have to be Secretary of State and then you'll become President. Uh, we'll look at uh, the era of good feelings, but I just want to note with James Monroe, he did gain Florida in the adams onis Treaty of 1819. Uh, we'll get the Missouri Compromise and the Monroe Doctrine, which we'll talk a little bit more. At the bottom, you can see that the Federalists did kind of live on, though, during this time with John Marshall and the Marshall Court. It will go from 1801 to 1835. So although the Federalist Party will dissolve, uh, they still have John Marshall in their strong central government government, uh, keeping those Federalist ideas alive. And remember, you'll get the market revolution uh, that we talked about last week, um, starting in the uh, 1814-1815s. Okay? So the era of good feeling. There is a strong sense of nationalism, one's pride. Uh, you defeat the British again, uh, you're one nation, your economy is going really, really well. Uh, you have Henry Clay's American system, and Henry Clay is, is super influential, and you need to know his name. And he really wanted three things in this. He wanted internal improvements, such as the Cumberland Road, such as the Erie Canal, uh, starting to get into railroads slowly, although those were really take off after the Civil War. He believed in the Bank of the United States, although hurt us in 1819 with the Panic of 1819, which many historians call our first Great Depression in the United States. Um, but he believed in, in, in that centralized uh, bank. He also wanted protective tariffs to protect business, manufacturing mostly. Okay, usually strong tariffs will hurt farmers because other nations will put tariffs on our goods, which many of those goods are usually farm goods. Uh, so those who want tariffs are usually businesses. And Western expansion. With the Louisiana Purchase, uh, you have people moving west. You have this large group of uh, immigrants coming in, Irish, uh, German, Chinese, too, uh, into our country. And so they are all vying for this American opportunity, which continues to push people west. So this idea of manifest destiny um, starts. But this is the era of good feeling. It's uniting uh, the nation. We are one nation together. Now, there are some problems going on. Remember, there's going to be this deep sectionalism that's starting to unfold. We'll get the economic divides, the socioeconomic divides, um, the upper class, the lower class, and we get a rising middle class with uh, industry. Uh, and you'll you have your, what do we do with the Native Americans? As Adam Sonis Treaty gives us Florida, uh, there was numerous uh, Native tribes there. What are we going to do with them? Uh, as we continue moving west, we have all these issues. So although things are really good, it's masking problems, especially slavery, uh, that's going to unfold, especially as we get into the 1840s, 50s, and 60s. Now, one of the big things you need to understand is the Missouri Compromise that comes out of this. And let me move my head. Okay, the Missouri, and you can look at this map. The Missouri Compromise, uh, at this time in 1819, we had... Uh, nine new states uh, come in and it was perfect. There was 11 free states, 
11 slave states. However, Missouri wants to be admitted as a slave state, and there's this issue. Talmadge, a congressman, uh, proposes this Talmadge Amendment, basically saying uh, we will let it be a slave state, but no new slaves will be allowed in, and slaves who turn 25 will be emancipated. This leaves the South in an uproar. Okay, no, this isn't going to happen. Remember, if it's a tie, 11-11, it doesn't really matter with the, um, the House of Representatives because the South kind of dominates that, although the North with immigration is, is coming closer to that. But really, they need to keep that tie in the Senate, 11-11. As long as they can do that, they can always veto things that would hurt their livelihood, especially when we got the cotton gin, king cotton. It, it, they're an agrarian society that makes a lot of money, not only in cotton, but tobacco as well. Uh, and so they hate this amendment. Henry Clay comes in. Henry Clay, uh, although <laughs> took a lot of L's when he tried to run for president, did a lot in Congress. And so he comes up with this compromise. Although he, you could say he put the first Band-Aid on uh, the issue of slavery, although you, you probably would say the Constitution does, does that with the three-fifths um, clause, the Fugitive Slave Clause, and then the um, Slave Trade Clause all in there, um, banning it in 1808, which Jefferson did. Okay, so we get the Clay's Compromise. He says, Missouri, you'll come in as a slave state. Maine, which also wanted to be admitted, will come in as a free state. Remember, Maine was had been a part of Massachusetts, um, and so now it will be a free state. That will keep it 12-12, slaves and free, so we'll have to keep that. But our problem is we have all this new land, the Louisiana Purchase. Missouri is the first state from that land. So what are we going to do? And so we create this line uh, to prohibit slavery above the 3630 line. And I hope you can see my arrow. It's north of the Arcan uh, Arkansas or Arkansas Territory. Anything above that will be free. Anything below that will be slave. Which brings up the idea for the South that, hey, we don't have much land here. The North has a lot of land. But to the West, there's something we might want. Hello, Spanish Mexico at this time. What is up? And we'll see what happens with that. So Missouri Compromise by Henry Clay puts a band-aid on the slavery issue, keeps it equal in the Senate, so we can move on. The next thing uh, Monroe does, uh, and this is kind of, the, oh, this is a good political cartoon, right? The balance, this is Clay, free states, slave states, 3630 line. You've got to know that Missouri's above that, okay? Yeah, this is pretty shaky, okay? So we understand this is a good one, good political cartoon for that. Another thing that uh, James Monroe did really uh, bring that sense of nationalism in and that unity and that we're kind of a, a big dog now, although we don't really want to go over into Europe, is the Monroe Doctrine. Important, but really not used until later. And presidents will use this as long as you, I mean, we're still using this verbiage. No further European colonization in the Western Hemisphere or interference in affairs, meaning European countries needed to stay out of issues in uh, the Americas. Uh, many of the uh, colonies of Spain and Portugal at this time were gaining their independence. We wanted to protect them. Britain wanted us to, wanted us to go into a deal with them, basically doing a um, combined statement, but we said, no, we want to be independent of Britain here. We'll do it ourselves. However, we did say if you had a colony at this time, we're not going to mess with you. If you already had a colony, great. But no new colonies or no new interference with these new nations. This is going to allow us, and still in some ways, shapes and forms, allow us to exert our influence uh, without being disturbed by other nations. Uh, so this is key. So era, good feelings, strong nationalism, one party, things are going good with the market revolution. We move west, voting from 90% of white males is happening. So there's a huge white male suffrage going on. And so the times are good. But there's some underlying problems that are going to start rising up. And then also, we're going to get a guy named Andrew Jackson who's going to throw a big wrench into our system. Until next time, have a great weekend.